Thanks everybody for coming out to the clinic. Uh, this is uh, titled, if you will, Taking the Fear Out of Improvisation. Uh, we're gonna start, like I always like to start, we're just gonna play a tune, um, and then we're gonna talk about it. So, okay. here we go. tell the changes? Anyone at all? Anybody want to guess? No. Can you guess what key it was in? A. A. Graham, were you playing in the key of A? No. Gabe, were you playing in the key of A? Maybe that's what you heard. A flat. A flat. Uh, close. <laughs> so, um, the idea of this clinic is taking the fear out of improvisation. How many of you have or had some trepidation about improvisation at some point in your life? Or head, it's fine. Me, I'm 100% included in that, okay, cool. So, one of the things that I, I ask a lot of people what they're scared of or what they're fearful of, and, and that word scared is kind of a scary word, <laughs> for lack of a better term. But the word scared implies that you're fearful that something will happen as a result of you improvising, right? So, when we talk about being scared of improvising, what most people say is, and I actually have here, the most common things that people said. They said, what do I play? What do I play? Improvise over the song, what do I play? It's not right in front of you. Wrong notes, following the chord changes, making a coherent solo as opposed to just noodling or playing scales. Repetition or finding new ideas. Embarrassment from peers, teachers, and the audience. That's a big one. And finally, and only a couple people said this, rhythms, phrasing, and creating melodies. So, how many of you in here play, currently play an instrument? Just whatever, beautiful. How many of you here, probably at jazz festivals, so most of you play jazz, right? How many of you in here know how to read music? Excellent, you're gonna be doing a lot of hand raising today. Do you know how to read music? Good, okay. Drummers, you gotta learn as well. So, uh, we'll get to that stuff in a second, but 
to answer the question of what tune were we playing, well, we were all playing three different songs, okay? Gabe, I told him, I said, just play eight bar phrases. Don't think of an AABA form, like a 32 bar form. Like I know a lot of people have um, different forms, like, you know, um, I don't know, rhythm changes or something like that, which is a 32 bar AABA form. So I told him, just play eight bar phrases. Don't even think of a form. I told Graham to play the song, I've never been in love before in the key of concert B flat, which goes up to E flat on the bridge and goes back down. I was playing Joy Spring, which starts in concert F, goes up to F sharp or G flat, then goes up to G and then cycles through. <laughs> so, we were playing three different tunes, kind of. Did the solo work? I mean, you clapped, unless you just, you're, you're conditioned to clap even if it's bad. But the solo worked, right? I'm not asking you to say it was great or anything, but did the solo work? Why? That's the key. So the, the thing is, why did that solo work when I, I didn't play the right notes? So the person who, a lot of people, most people, I pulled like, I think it was like two or 250 people, and like, 80 or 90 of them said they're afraid of playing the wrong notes. Can you guys hear me in the back okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Can I answer the question? Can you answer the question? Sure. It worked because the rhythm was all time. Hey, and that's exactly what I'm getting to today. Because so many, that's 100,000 percent. That's a good student right there. Everybody round of applause. <laughs> I didn't pay him to be here. Okay. <laughs> So, and the thing is you don't have to know the answer, and that's fine. The idea of you coming to a clinic, or me going to a clinic, or seeing someone else is that they're gonna hopefully have answers uh, to answer my fears or answer my questions. So, the reason why this solo worked is because of a couple key things. Phrasing, rhythms, and interaction. Okay, phrasing, rhythms, and interaction. Phrasing literally means the sentences when we speak. If I always spoke like this and then I started new sentences, and then every time I got to the end of a sentence, I did this weird pause. All the words written down were correct. If you read that on a piece of paper, it would have been correct. Just like when you guys play a transcription that somebody did online, and you read the notes in a row, you played it correct. I have a student come to me, hey, I learned this new transcription. I said, oh, I love that solo. Play it for me. And then we listen to the recording. I said, that's not the same thing. That's not quite the same. And the reason is phrasing. So, when I'm having a conversation with the band, and we're talking about soloing, and whether you're up in front of a band, a big band, a combo, you're a, you're a vocalist soloing um, in, in a group, phrasing is going to be one of the most important things. So, let's do a little example about phrasing, and then we'll get to some of the other elements in a second. So, let's do, uh, let's just play B-flat. Sure. We'll all play B-flat. Here we go, phrasing. A one, two, uh, 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 uh. Did phrasing work? Yeah. So I, in that instance, I used a standard phrasing of a 12-bar blues. And by the way, this clinic is not going to get super technical. I'm not going to go into tritone substitutions and culture and changes and stuff, which I love. This is for general improvising and really getting you to a point where you don't feel so paralyzed that I don't know what to play. I don't want anybody to stare at me. I don't want to mess up. I don't want to play the wrong notes. Because I see it every day. I teach middle school kids every day, and they're very, very nervous when they solo. And then they're nervous, and then people say, just solo. Just play this. And then they go to high school, and then they're nervous. And I see them on stage, and they go, ah. Oh. The saxophone thing. You ever hear saxophone do this in a solo? <laughs> then you gotta lean back a little. <laughs> Close your eyes. That's how you kill him. Right, sax, saxophone player, stop doing that. Please, it's annoying. Also, stop bending every note. This isn't a solo. <laughs> hey, it's my clinic, I can say whatever I want. I can say whatever I want. So, phrasing is the first thing. I, how many different notes did I play in that solo? Did right now in the blues? Like I basically played one, but I added a couple other ones. Okay, I, I cheated a little bit. <laughs> so when I when you play when you're talking about phrasing in a solo, I'm thinking of what does the song, what kind of phrasing would fit the song? And you might not know that. That's why teachers are here. So for a blues, there are three four bar sections. Okay, can you guys play the blues one more time, one chorus? Check out the three four bar sections really quick. Just hear these three phrases: one, a two, a one, two, three, and. Phrase one here. Relax. Now phrase two. Phrase three. And back to the top. Okay? So if you 
want to just out of nowhere play all the wrong notes, play all the wrong everything, you know that you can play three, four bar phrases, okay? Okay, phrasing, what if I'm playing a song that's, that's weird uh, form or weird something and I, you know, I don't know about phrasing? Then it gets to rhythms, okay? Rhythms and style to me are intertwined. I think everybody in here can do rhythms and we're gonna, you're all gonna participate in a second. You didn't think you were going to, you're all gonna participate in a second. Because um, we all have our voices here, or our hands, we can clap, um, we, can, we can do this, okay? I believe in you. So rhythms and style, let's talk about all this together. Rhythm, style, pocket, tempo, all that stuff to me means the same thing. Or not, doesn't, doesn't mean the same thing, they're all in the same basket. So when we're playing a medium swing, which is what I would call this, what are some standard rhythms you might play? Like what are some rhythms that might fit? Can anybody sing a rhythm that would fit? Like a, like a one measure rhythm, four beats, go. Da, 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 da. So the end of one and the beat three. Here we go. We're gonna do. I'm gonna do a 12 bar blues solo only using that rhythm. Let's do G flat. Let's change the key. I'm tired of being G flat blues. One, the two. Learn your keys, kids. Ready? <laughs> It was, it was wonderful. The rhythms worked, everything was beautiful. So, obviously, you're not gonna do that for an entire solo, or maybe you do, and that's, that's cool too. Um, but the rhythms are really gonna have to match the style. So, if we take a 12 bar blues, right, and we say, okay, we're playing medium swing, so I know rhythms. Boo ba da da, ba 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 da. By the way, what's a good way to figure out what rhythms fit a style? How can you do that? Just say, a teacher says, listen, I'm a classical player, I know nothing about jazz, but here we have the solo on this medium swing song. How can you figure out rhythms? Listening. Listening, 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 listening. How many of you have ever been told to transcribe someone or listen to someone for, it, for help? Yeah, good, good, good. So, I'm, I'm, I have a little different approach to transcribing than some people have. So, by the way, transcribing, for those of you who don't know, is listening to a solo, listening to a song, listening to something, and then learning it. It doesn't mean writing it down. You can write it down if you want, you can also just learn it on your instrument. So, listening is gonna be the key thing that kind of overarches everything we talk about today in this clinic, and that's figuring out what works and what doesn't. Remember, there's, there's only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. And the golden rule of music that I say is, if it sounds good, it is good. So I don't care if, if someone played the right note, I don't care if somebody you know, played 16th note lines really fast. Did it sound good to you? If the answer is yes, then it sounded good. It's a good solo or a good song. So, transcription. So my, my thoughts on transcription are this. I know a lot of people say, transcribe solos nonstop, all, all, all the way through solos, and that's great if you have the time, right? And, and, and you have the willpower to actually do that. But sometimes transcribing simple phrases can really, really help you. So, learning a language, when you're born, you learn by hearing first, and then you learn to read and write much after. Same thing when you're playing music, or, or it should be the same thing when you're playing music. The problem is we teach you guys, you know, how to read notes, how to read notes and read this, and it's very important. But if you're learning the, the art and the language that is jazz improvisation, you have to listen. Okay, what do I listen to? Well, ask your teachers for some advice on who to listen to. Um, how many saxophone players do I have in here? A lot of saxophone players, cool. Who are some of your favorite saxophone players? Cannibal Adderley. Oh, Cannibal Adderley. Beautiful. I saw some in the back. Favorite saxophone player? Sonny Rollins. Sonny, oh, beautiful. Sonny Rollins, great. Yeah. Charlie Parker. Charlie, Charlie Parker basically started all this bebop stuff. One more. Cool trip. John Cole. Yeah, see, you guys got it. So, listening to these guys. Now, if you go in and try to transcribe Giant Steps and you've never transcribed anything before, <laughs> it might be difficult for you, right? But the idea is this, and, and here's what I want you to take away from the trans. I don't want to, I, I do want to play a lot. I don't want to talk nonstop. The transcription aspect is this. When you go to transcribe, what are you transcribing? And I don't mean what solo, I mean what are you trying to get out of the transcription? It's, not, it's a rhetorical question, do you think? So, what, you need to think in your head, you need to think in your head, what am I trying to learn from this? So, if you're going into it, I want to learn articulation. Right? I'm going to learn articulation from Cannonball. I didn't make any of that 
stuff up. He played that 80 years ago. 60 years ago. So, you know what I mean? So, so that's the thing. So we see Charlie Parker. The, the, the Charlie Parker, like... A lot of ghosted notes, a lot of things like that. Now, I'm not asking you to transcribe those hard things, but if you go in and you're listening to Sonny Rollins, you have to listen to some of those rhythms and say, which ones speak to me? What do I like? You ever listen to a solo and then go, ooh, I like that. You ever do that? Or you go, ooh, or uh, or eh. The soloist should always leave, I always tell people, always leave time for the audience to go, woo. You need that. Uh. Woo! <laughs> because it has two effects. One, one, if, if, you, if you don't hear woo, that means what you played was trash. Two, it forces you to actually phrase correctly. It forces you to phrase correctly. So, the last thing to say on transcription, that, that's a big part of it. When you go to listen to someone, have an idea of what you want to get out of it. So I want to get rhythms out of it, and this comes back to the rhythm thing. I'm going to be a proponent of transcribing individual measures of rhythm. One of my favorite saxophone players, still living, Dick Oates, right? He has a lot of, yeah, he has a lot of great stuff, but a lot of times his solos are eight minutes long, and I ain't got the time to sit there and transcribe eight minutes of music right now. So what I'll do is I'll say, what part sticks out to me? All right, so he played this line. Can you, can you just play like a two five to C major? That's like two bars each. I mean, like a bar of D minor, bar of G, bar of D out one, a two. Check this out. Two, three. Uh. Woo! Right. So I stole that from Dick Oates, and and so just that little line right there, because I went woo when I listened to it. So what did I steal from that? Obviously, I stole the entire line, but I, I learned, listen to that, that articulation. Has these little pops and little bangs in it, and it speaks to me. Also, harmonically, not to get too deep, but harmonically, over the G7. Thank you, Graham. Yeah, so he does this, this super weird tritone sub thing where he basically plays a concert, uh, concert B major over a G7 chord, and then uses like the alt scale. Whatever, not to get too deep. But I took that one little line, and then you can say, okay, I'm gonna take a piece from that. I'm gonna take that rhythm now. I'm gonna take that rhythm. Uh, one, two, do the same thing. One, two, three, four. So you can create the same kind of line based on it, and then you can go on and on and on and on and on, and then vary the rhythm, and then vary the notes, and then vary this. So transcription is so important, and, and I know I didn't say anything very specific about that, like exactly, but when you listen to someone, when you listen to a solo, when somebody says to you, listen to this player to learn, listen to this guy, don't just put it on the background and have it be this random, you know, kind of background noise. Have it be an, be an active listening experience. And when you hear something good, stop it and try to figure it out. You don't have to figure out the entire line. You don't have to figure, sometimes you can figure out one note. Like, um, can you do the same thing again? One, a two, a one, two, three, and. Ooh, that one note, what was that one note? I would literally, tra I, have, I have a transcription one time and I sat down with a book to transcribe and I listened for that one note and I heard it and then I closed the book and I said, all right, I'm done for the day because that spoke to me that much. So, uh, that is one thing that is super important. I'm not gonna talk this long on any other topic today, but transcription, transcribing, listening, 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 listening is so crucial. And yes, you should listen to just enjoy it. I'm not saying you have to always make it an academic exercise. But when you do um, transcribe and you do listen, really have a goal in mind. It could be rhythms, just transcribing rhythms. This is another thing that I tell people to do is, Sometimes you, you, you know, just say you listen to Charlie Parker, Sonny Rollins is a good example. Just say you like his rhythms, but like, you know, the solos, you're like, yeah, he just plays really inside. Well, just transcribe the rhythms. Sometimes I like to take someone from like, I'll take a Josh Redman solo, and I'll transcribe his notes, and I'll put it to uh, Dexter Gordon's rhythms. Or I'll take even a, even a bigger difference. I'll take like Chris Potter's rhythms, right? I'll take his super wild rhythms, but put it to like a Lester Young solo and try to make that work and see what happens. And sometimes it sounds terrible, and sometimes it sounds really good. But the idea is you're taking things that you like and kind of combining them together to give you ideas. Remember, soloing is not just thinking of things out of thin air and just randomly playing them. 
It's saying, what is the band doing? What should I do to fit that thing, okay? Excellent. Transcription. Very, 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 very important. Now, let's try something here. So, when we play swing, we obviously have swing rhythms, we have some things. So, I want to do a little call and response, okay? Most of you here are, are musicians. Even if you're not musicians, I still want you to participate. We're gonna do, let's do a blues. Somebody pick a key of a blues, not B flat or G flat. F sharp. F, I just said not B flat or G flat. <laughs> F sharp, he says. Somebody make a meme out of it. Pick a key besides G flat. No, I know, I know, I, I heard you. I'm saying, I'm going back to G So D flat blues. What's a famous blues in the key of D flat? Anybody know? What's a famous song in the key of D flat? I'll take your word for it. I don't know if that is. So, what are the, the main elements to me of improvisation are this. Feel, rhythm, style, phrasing. Nowhere did I mention notes yet. No technique, no notes. You don't need technique to be a good jazz musician. So, we're going to take feel, and this is where, where it's really important that uh, the fear thing, where I think it really comes in, okay? Transcription, whatever, and especially if you're a young musician, I might be talking about transcribing and listening and writing it down, that might seem way too hard for you. And that's fine, I wanted to get that out of the way. Because, now we're gonna do the very practical thing. So if you take a blues, like once again, a 12 bar blues, I'm sure most of you have either played it or heard it or whatever. You can take two bar phrases the entire time, as long as you pick rhythms that work. How do you know what rhythms work? By listening. There's also a great way, even if you don't have access, not access to listening, because you all do, but if you look in your charts, if you guys are playing a song, look in your song and look for the melody. Look for the melody and find a rhythm in the melody, okay? Is everybody into this melody? D flat jam blues in this case. So that's a melody, you can literally use that phrase, that's a three bar phrase, over the blues, you can use it in any, any situation. So find a rhythm that you can latch onto and repeat it over and over. Do not think jazz is, oh, I'm playing in the key of C, so I'm gonna play, what C scale can I play? So many kids ask me that, what scale do I play? I say, don't play scales. Don't do it. Know your scales, know how to do it, but if you just play, if you inserted scales over chords in a song, you're gonna sound like you're painting by numbers. Okay, you know what paint by numbers is? It's like red is five, so every time you see a five, you paint in red. There's no artistic, uh, or creative outlet for that. It's just kind of an academic filling in exercise. Know your scales, don't just input them in for no reason. So let's play a D flat blues, but we're gonna do something a little different. I need the audience to either sing or clap or say it on da or something. I'm gonna do a two bar phrase. I want you to respond with a two bar phrase. Can we handle that? It doesn't matter, we're gonna do it anyway. Here we go. One, a two, B, first, two, three, and When you're a baby, once again, to harken back to that, when you're a baby, you don't, when you're, you know, you don't say mama or dada because somebody handed you a book and you read it out of the book, right? Now, some of you are laughing. Why do we do that in jazz? When I, I have students, you know, they'll come to me or they'll send me messages and say, hey, I've just sold this song I've never sold before. I said, okay, you know, let me see it. They said, here's the song, and my director gave me this scale sheet. 
I said, okay, okay, what's the scale sheet for? They said, well, he said, each, you know, this chord is G7, so use G mixolydian. Okay. This, this chord is A minor, so he said, use A Dorian. I said, oh, okay, why? Yeah, exactly, that's the answer I got too. Because they, they and I'm, this is not to, to rag on directors, because, you know, somebody asked me, hey, I'm learning this French horn concerto, I'm, I'm curious about this one inflection, I would say, I probably got a little, you know, so, so that's why you come to private directions, that's why you ask people, but you have to think, when you're learning jazz as a language, for the first 10 years of playing it, you're not gonna be that good at it. You're just not, so people think, oh, I never sold before, and I have to sold this competition tomorrow, and it's over uh, 26-2. I said, just, just play whatever you want because nothing's going to work. But what can you do to make that work? Do you know 26 2? It's, how about a, a moment? No, a, what's another like weird tune? Like, you know, like Countdown? Moments Notice. Here we go. You guys know Moments Notice? Yeah. Here we go. Moments Notice. Don't get too hyped when you hear it. Here we go. One, a two. Just from the, from the top of the tune, not the intro thing. One, two, a one, two, three, five. Right. Yeah, that's pretty good. Play the tune at all. Don't clap. That was not good. <laughs> no, so so did that solo work? Yes. yes. Also, just a, a quick caveat, I'm getting away with it more because there's no chordal instrument. Okay? If there were someone playing like really heavy like chords and I'm playing this out and they're not an interactive piano player and they're not like following me, it's gonna it might sound a little weird. But it'll sound better than if we did this. Can we play all things you are? One, a two, a one, two, three, one. Stop, I can't listen to that anymore. That, yeah, boo, thank you. Now, which of those two solos did I play the correct notes in? Okay, both of them. Which one did I play the changes in? The second one. Right? But which one would you rather hear if you're if you're at Chris's Jazz Cafe, you're at South, you're at you know the 55 bar, you're at Smalls. Which one would you rather hear? First or second one? First one! I didn't play any of the right notes, anything, any of the changes. What did I focus on? Phrasing, rhythm, and now the most important, well one of the most important parts, one of the top hundred most important parts of improvising, interaction in the band. So, um, now you know before we talk about interaction, because I'm gonna have you guys work pretty hard. You're getting too, you're too easy over there. You're sitting right there. By the way, round of applause for the band again. If you don't know, it's Dave Barco on the drum set, Graham Kozak on the double bass. So, the rhythms, the phrasing, guys, if, I, if you take nothing away from this clinic other than this, is that rhythms and phrasing matter infinitely more than the notes, okay? So that's why when somebody hands you a scale sheet or something and it has no context, it drives me nuts. Now, is it important to know that, yeah, over a 2 five, one you think Dorian, Mixolydian, Major, whatever. Yeah, that's fine, that's cool. But that's not melody. When you play a song and you play a melody, there's different things that create a melody as opposed to just playing scales. Most songs, most melodies aren't built off of scales per se. And when I say built off of, I mean they don't diatonically go up the scale. They use parts of the scale, guide tone lines, stuff like that, we're not gonna really get into that today. How many of you know what a guide tone line is or a, um, a, 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 you know, just a leading tone line, right? It's just basically finding tones in each chord that move smoothly to the next chord. So that, the example that I played second over All Things You Are was very, um, very what I call vertical playing. So I basically played over this chord, and then as soon as I got to the next chord, I disregarded what came before it. As opposed to... So if you know who all things are, that's a nice simple guide tone line you can go through that. And that is way easier to practice and to learn than try and run all the scales. You know, that's that's it's cool to know that, but but if you're trying to implement that in your solo, you're gonna get confused. It's way too many things to think about, and it's not musical, which is the number one thing. Does it sound good? If the answer is no, then throw it away. 
try to make it sound good. So, along with rhythms, phrasing, and all that is interaction in the band. Did you guys know the word solo is actually wrong 99% of the time? Do you know that? What is a solo? Somebody tell me what a solo is. When you're the only one playing. Thank you, yes. I, the only time I soloed so far is when I'm talking or when I just demonstrate this. When all three of us are playing, that's not a solo. We use the term solo to really mean one person is the lead player of the ensemble in there. In the jazz setting, they're creating the melodies on the spot. That's what we use as the word solo, but it's really not a solo. This is a solo. That's a solo, okay? That's a solo. You guys can go home happy now. So, interaction and solo. I'm gonna get, I'm, I feel like I'm talking way incredibly too much, which I always do. Somebody tell me, what, is, what, what type of interaction um, can you do as, a, as a, either a soloist or a rhythm section player? Like, what things should you be looking for? Like, what, what cues should you be looking to actually interact? Yes? Uh, like rhythms, they can like, like, kind of like trade off like trade off rhythms. Duo. Let's do impressions. So we're gonna do <laughs> just do a some Kenny Garrett and Tammy Mott stuff. Let's do some rhythms. Only rhythms, no phrases. So I don't just play. I don't even care if it's impressions. One, two, <laughs> one, two, three. <laughs> Disregarded all the notes. So, still rhythms. You, it still what? It still works. It still works. Why, though? And this is only swing music, but it works because, like we said, the rhythms, the feel, the phrasing, that's what music is. I'm going to say this, this statement, and I mean it the way I say it. Notes isn't music. Not notes aren't music. Notes isn't music. Playing notes is not music. You, Mozart, me, and Justin Bieber all play the same 12 notes. I'm not talking about other systems in, in Eastern music. I'm just talking about our 12 note system. All, all of us can play all 12 notes. I can throw a baby at that piano and it's gonna play all 12 notes. Not at the piano, you know. <laughs> I mean, that'll work too. All right, so. <laughs> a baby can, can put their hand down, play all 12 notes. So once you play all 12 notes, that's it, you're done. You've done everything you can do harmonically. Now it's about organizing those notes to making music. So we've only done swing so far. So let's do like, like, um, like a Boston Nova E type thing. So interact, and we're still on interaction. So interaction in the band, you can do rhythmic interaction, right? And but you can also do like range interaction, like range on the instrument. You can do dynamic interaction. So and and this goes for if, if how many people here are not saxophone players? Like you're you're an other instrument player. Cool. So if you're if you're another instrument, like a you know trumpet or trombone, any wind instrument, you're gonna take what I'm saying. But if you're a rhythm section instrument, keyboard, you know vibes, uh, bass, guitar, drums. You, your responsibility in a solo is to let the soloist, once again, to, for lack of a better term, take the lead and then say, what can I do to make this the most musical thing possible? So it might be, if you're doing a hard driving song, but the soloist comes up. You can't just say, I don't care what you're playing, I'm gonna do this, because now it's gonna sound weird. And in a solo situation, the person up front does have the lead. Now, there are times when the drummer's gonna build it up and I might have thought not to build it up, but they're doing it, so I'm gonna do that as well. So as a soloist, you're not, it's not your way of the highway. It's, it's a give and take all the way through. So let's play like Black Orpheus. No? <laughs> I'm sorry for jumping spot. I probably should have talked about these tunes ahead of time. This is real life. This is what you do on the game. You say, you know Black Orpheus? No. And then you, usually you say, I'll just get out I real pro on your phone. And we're not going to do that. Let's do like uh, uh, Girl from Ipanema or something. Yeah, Girl from Ipanema. So we're going to do some different kinds of interaction here, all different kinds, and see if you can spot what they are. One, two,
Fuck. You notice that in a song like that, because of the, the overall style and the overall feel of that tune, it's not going to be, you're not going to be as free to do insanely crazy things. There were a couple different things that we did. What, what, are, what are one of the interaction things that, that you may have heard? Yep. Yeah, so that's a good point. So all this stuff about interaction, that, that's really good actually, because you don't always have to play what the soloist is playing directly back to them. And Gabe does a, such a good job at this, guys. When I play a rhythm, like uh, the, the common thing for a drummer, if I go, if you're trying to interact, when you first start this, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna listen to the solo, and they go, here's what, like quarter and triplets. The, the tendency is for the drummer to then try to go, like you're in Phil Collins' big band. You know? But, but he might fill it in. I might go, just something that musically leads in because just because I played it doesn't mean it needs to be repeated. But I did leave space and I very obviously went, something like that, just to kind of lead it in. Or did you guys hear the one time when Graham played my same line back to me? Yeah. I forget what I played, but it was cool and he sounded really good at it. And it's, it's, that's another thing. It was a harmonic thing, and he didn't play the exact notes I played, unless he did. But I don't think he did. Um, <laughs> so, but, but I, I went up, and, and talking about range and intervals, I went, oh, bwee, 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 da, da. he went, doo, 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 doo. it was really cool. And it, and it brought your ear to this new thing, and then we got to the new section. All these things are done without talking about notes. This, this clinic should have been like taking the notes out of improvisation instead of taking the fear out of improv. Okay. So, you know, I know I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about a lot of music specific stuff and not the fear aspect of it. But what I'm hoping that you guys are, are hearing is that a lot of the ways you're taught and a lot of the ways you think about music are always notes based. Is that kind of fair to say? A lot of, yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with playing the right notes, obviously. You know, I, I hope you do and I hope you learn the changes and everything. But the first thing that you always play and the first thing that you should always shoot for is rhythms, is phrasing is interaction with the band, um, the style, the feel, all those little things. So how about we play like um, everybody's favorite? Uh, we're at Harvard. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, everybody. You, you know what that is, right? Uh, you can start off with something. Thank you. 
Yeah. Thank you. So, where was the high point of that solo? Or what, what, what did I do during the high point? Or did you know where the high point of the solo was? Did you, like, the high point is in, like, the climax of the solo, the, the, the melodic um, peak. Do you know what I was doing? It was when I was doing this, when, when Gabe led into this and he started playing something on the, I think the bell of the ride salon, I went, It was not when I was, Why? Once again. So we have to think about that. So we built it up to a certain thing. Did you notice how soft this song started? Yes, drummers, you can play that soft. It's possible, <laughs> okay? <laughs> no matter what you tell your directors, we know you can play that soft. So start it up, relax. Did you guys feel that the first, the, the reason why you went, uh, all I was playing was concert F minor pentatonic. That's all you need over that tune if you're starting out. Once again, oh, it is a scale, but if you if you took the scale approach to the song, you would say, okay, so I'm playing, okay, B flat minor, and then and, and C, and then D flat, okay, so there's like a, a Dorian, uh, uh, Ioni, no, an Aeolian, a natural, Cut that stuff out of there. You don't need that. You can play one note over the whole song, right? Rhythms, phrasing. So this song requires a different rhythmic and phrasing aspect than a swing song would. It's actually much closer than you think. It's the, the bossa nova is the one that's the outlier. This is very close to playing a swing song. But the big difference in this is I'm feeling beat one a lot. I'm leading it to beat one, whereas in a jazz song, I'm trying to hide beat one a lot of the times um, and let kind of the bass drop at beat one or if you're leading into it but I'm not trying to lead to be one. So these things, just, just using rhythms, using phrasing, is a way for you guys to just tip your, tip your toe, dip your toes into improvisation, okay? I know a lot of you said you had some trepidations about improvisation, and some of you had um, you know, fears about improvisation. Does anybody want to say what their fears are about improvisation? Anybody? Bueller? Yeah. Yes. So, you like playing, what, what instruments do you play? I'm the saxophone. Beautiful. So, your sax, so, sorry, saxophone's the star of the show, so you're always gonna be the center of attention. Sorry, everybody else. Now, so, when you improv, do you want to improvise? I'm scared, too scared. I, I'm not, I, I didn't ask you if you're scared of it. Do you want to improvise? The answer is yes. Or else, I don't know why you're, you're right here, right? So, I knew the answer. The answer is yes. So the idea is now you have to really look into it and say, because like, I used to be, guys, I used to be petrified when I was in high school of, of performance. Not even, not even solo, petrified before, and then I go up on stage and like once I finally played it was cool. But like I used to be so scared because of different reasons and pressure I put on myself and I wanted to do this and I wanted to do all these things. But you have to say, why are you scared? Now I talked about in the beginning, I said fear of embarrassment or whatever, being singled out or being in front of an audience or being in front of directors. Do you, do you solo when you're at home? Do you ever improvise at home? Maybe? A little bit, okay. So it's totally cool. So here's the thing. When you do that, and, and you're not the only one in this room who feels exactly that way. They just didn't have the guts to say it like you did. So I appreciate that. So, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah it's all good. So when you, when you think about what to do, and, and you know, there's, there's gonna be other things that, that people can help you with, with actual stage presence and stage fright and those kind of things. But my, my hope is that knowledge of what to do, here it starts with what to play, knowledge of what to do and going in prepared will help you have a better performance, will help you feel better. Because a lot of people go into it, the reason why they're scared in front of people because they're afraid of messing up. Why are you afraid of messing up? Playing the wrong notes, blah, 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 and it goes down the line. But proper preparation prevents poor performance. So if you guys prepare properly, and also, Practice makes permanent, not perfect, because you can practice incorrectly. Perfect practice makes perfect. Just practicing wrong. I have clarinet players come in fourth grade. Miss Pollock, I practiced all week. I said, play me a C five minute scale. Da 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 da. The right hand's on top, it should be on the bottom. Okay? Because they practice like that all week, so that's now permanent. So practice makes permanent and proper preparation prevents poor performance. Mr. Pollock's peas, if you will. <laughs> For lack of a better word. So hey, it works. So when, you, when, you, when you're nervous about improvising, whether it's you know, in front of a band, at home, in front of friends, you're doing something, 
Find the simple things that you can do to fit whatever you're doing. And I, I promise you, if you go in more confident, and that's the hard part, if you go into a solo, into a performance, more confident r musically, you will have a better better outcome you know, emotionally and just, just as part of the performance. Um, the ways to get confident you know, are just saying, what do I have to do? What would fit the situation? What do I need to do to do that? And then that goes back to everything I've been saying for the last hour is, you know, especially in jazz, as this is basically focused on jazz, rhythms, phrasing, what are we doing? You know, um, somebody pick a time signature for us from one to seven. Okay. Everybody says seven. Five or seven? Five, four. Five. Okay, we're gonna play something in five. Pick a key. F sharp, minor. We are in F sharp. What did you say? A flat. Does anyone want to hear? What? C flat. C flat. So we're gonna do C flat. Almost out of here. C flat. Um, major or minor. Major. Who says major? Raise your hand. Who says minor? Raise your hand. Oh man, it's pretty split. We'll do minor. C flat minor. Just just groove. And do you want swing, funk, or like a, a Latin kind of thing? Okay, so a groove. We'll, we'll groove. How about that? Just like a, like a like the same kind of groove, almost a little faster. In C flat minor. In five. No five. We'll do in five. Right now, as a soloist, when you're scared and you're going, oh my god, I don't know what to do. Notes don't matter. Trying to fit that group. One, four, five, one, four, five, one, four, five, one, four, five. So we're gonna aim for beat one. Here we go. given to me. I tried to do what you asked of me. Did we do that? Okay. So, there was no, like, scales, there were no licks, there were no, you know, oh, I heard this person play this, even though I told you to do that before, but I didn't do any of that stuff because the cool thing about playing in five and the cool thing about playing in a weird key is that you can't play your normal stuff, right? If I said, all right, alto players, let's play a concert F blues. Oh, I hear those Charlie Parker licks. Oh, I hear them, boy. If I said, let's play uh, impressions. You know, I'd hear, well, I'd hear that Dorian scale, I'd hear that D Dorian, and the D flat Dorian. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't, I don't want to be like this like negative person about that, but what I want you to think of is, musically did it make sense? If not, why? And if you don't know why, listen to people where the music does make sense, and then say, why did that make sense? Compare them next to each other. What, what are they doing? And break it down. What are they doing rhythmically that I'm not doing? What are they doing harmonically that I'm not doing? What are they doing in the range that I'm not doing? And, and really, really listen, because people are like, oh, man, Chris Potter, I listen to him, and he's playing all this stuff, and he's going all over the horn. But when you really break it down, Chris Potter is a rhythmic saxophone player. You guys know Chris Potter? Yeah. yeah. He's probably the, I hate to use this term, but he might be the best saxophone player on the planet right now, like technician, right? He can play anything you want. But when you listen to him play, he does a lot of stuff like this, right? With, with um, 
Who's you it? have Nate Smith on drums. Eric Harlan, Eric Harlan Craig Taborn, right on Rhodes. Yeah. And that's the underground band or whatever he calls it. Chris Potter's underground, right? Yeah. So, you know, there, there's a lot of things that he does that, that are super complicated. He has these songs that are 17 and 11. But when you really break it down, all he's doing is playing rhythmic things. He's like a drummer just that plays notes on the saxophone. And the drummer is like a drummer who plays notes on the drums. Because <laughs> he does all sorts of different things. It's not just rhythms. But when you really break it down, that fit what we're doing. And you can take, you, we can go all day and say, pick a key, pick a style, pick a time signature, pick whatever, and, and make music out of it. The final thing I want to talk about is melody. And this really, this, this is where notes sort of matter a little bit, a little bit. When you improvise, your goal is to create a melody on the spot that fits what's going on in the band, okay? It's not necessarily to rip out your fastest lines and all this stuff, and, and not that there's anything wrong with that, because I love playing fast and everything, but does it make sense? Are you gonna start your solo playing fast? Then where's it gonna go? Somebody says, ever hear this? Tell a story in your solo, tell a story. Anybody ever say that? You ever hear that, right? And then most of you go, what are you talking about? That's only for vocalists to like tell the story of the song. But when you think about it, what are the elements? This is, once again, break this stuff down and it'll be, there's no secret to, to improvisation, by the way. There's no secret to this stuff. It's, it's the same from the, the beginning of, of improvised music is there's a, a groove or a rhythm or a key or whatever. There's certain parameters we have to follow. And then what do we want to sound like over it? Do we want to fit it perfectly? Do we want to do something crazy? You know, you can say, oh, I'll play B-flat blues and I'll play in the key of B major the whole time, and it'll create a certain tension. If it's the tension you like, then it's correct. If it sounds good to you, it's good. Remember, if it sounds good, it is good. So, when we talk about melody, though, and you, you break down, what is a melody? There's, can anybody tell me, like, a story arc? What's a story arc? Can, can somebody explain the different parts? Anybody in here? Do you guys read books? Someone else? Yes, you are. Yes, explain. Beginning, and then they, like, build Yes. Ah, most of the arcs, by the way, are not like this, they're not a triangle. It's like 80% of building, and there, there's like turmoil on the way, you know, there's, oh my god, what did you say? Oh my god. You dated that girl? Oh my god. And you're on the way, right? And then there's some climax to it, and then there's a nice resolution, and everybody goes home happy. Disney movie to a T. Disney movie is a great way to to approach soloing as well. If you look at a Disney movie, look at the arc of a Disney movie and then build your solo that way, it works really well. Plus it makes people happy because it's Disney. So. But even thinking of the idea of building a story arc based on Disney, you'll probably get sued by the Disney company, so don't even, don't even try. <laughs> or, or Lucas Films, don't do Star Wars stuff either. So, getting off on a tangent here. The story arc of your solo. This is getting a little bit more into it, but when we're talking about melody, it's not just playing the notes in a row, it's about what are we building? So let's try to build, build a melody here over, I've never been loved before, which is like one of my favorite tunes ever. Actually, let's, you know, we'll save that for the end. Yeah. Dude, I've never been loved before now. We'll just play that on the way out. I think there's people gonna be kicking me out of here soon, but you know what? I'll respect them and I'll give them. So we're gonna do a nice story arc here, but it's gonna be a one chorus arc. We're gonna follow that arc. It's gonna be basically 75% building up and then the last 25% is the resolution, okay? Remember, notes don't matter nearly as much as everything else. It matters as much as the music. Music and notes are different things. Here we go. Just one chorus, we'll just start with things like this. This is the solo section. One, two, uh, uh, uh. And when you go to listen to other soloists and you go to listen to other songs, some of these things are going to start jumping out and you're going to go, wait a minute. I used to just think that was this weird, cool thing, but all he's doing is like playing that rhythm and the drummer played it. Oh, 
oh, this arc now, listen to it. Most songs, if you have a solo, now, if you get to like long solos and stuff, and we're just gonna play a tune at the end here, you can have multiple of those arcs within the, within the same song. It doesn't just have to be like that, because if you take a four minute solo, you shouldn't build it up for three and a half minutes and then just resolve at the end, because it'll get honestly boring after a while. Do any of you have any questions for me about any of this stuff that I could, that for the greater, you know, not super specific, we can talk after, but anything about rhythms, anything about fear of, of getting up and about making stuff? Yes? Ella Fitzgerald, what type of uh, improvisation did she do? Can you illustrate that on your instrument? She does, her improvisation is called The Best. <laughs> I can I, I can demonstrate. So if little known fact, well maybe it's not little known, but you know she couldn't read music, guys. Ella Fitzgerald, what I consider is the greatest vocalist of any genre of any anything ever. She's the greatest vocalist in my opinion. She had, and and to your point, bringing her up is a perfect thing for this because when when Ella Fitzgerald sings in solos. When she sings the melody, she sounds like a horn player the way she phrases it and all the little things she does, but she's also telling that literal story of, of the lyrics. Then when she goes to improvise, she takes the, the leading tone and guide tone thing to a, to, a perfect, um, to a perfect level. And uh, let me see if I can demonstrate that real quick. I know we have to get out of here. So think, when, I, when I solo, let's do uh, all the things you are again, just from the top. And um, she has perfect melodies but what she does so, so, so well is leaving space and leaving her phrasing to make room for the rhythm sections, to make room for everybody else. So let me, let me see if I can demonstrate that and try to do it some justice. One, two, one, two, three. She combines literally everything we're talking about here in, in such a, a beautiful way. And, and talk about transcribing, go transcribe an Ella Fitzgerald solo, and not, not even solo, the way she sings the melody. There, there's, this, there's this recording of Mac the Knife online, I forget what year it's from, it's on YouTube, and she forgets the words. You guys ever hear that? Oh, it, that's, the great, that's the greatest musical performance isolated, I think, ever. She forgets the words of Mac the Knife, you guys know, and the uh, shark, right? and it switches, it goes up in key every time, and she just starts singing about the band. And it's like, it's one of those things where like, I get goosebumps every time I watch it. I probably watched it 80 or 90 times by now, like, not joking. And it's because it's so musical, and it's so swinging, and yeah, she does fit the key, because it does, it does go up a half step, but mostly, is she's singing about the band, she's interacting with the band, everybody's having a good time, and it's, it's not this academic thing where she's trying to say, okay, Mac the Knife starts in concert F, so I'm gonna play, I'm gonna scat sing an F major scale. No, she says, this is super swinging, I'm gonna be in the pocket, and she builds it up. As the key builds, she builds, and what I say by build, I mean volume, amount of notes, the range of her notes goes up. Her arms start flailing more, it's, a, it's like, it, it's, it's, go check it out, it's, it's Ella Fitzgerald, Mac the Knife, I forget exactly which concert, but she, Forgets. Brian, you know the one where she forgets the words? Exactly. It's it's you know it's in black and white and it's it's do yourself a favor. If you remember how before I said if you do nothing else, no, if you do nothing else from this, if you've learned nothing else, go watch that recording. <laughs> so uh, I know we have to get out of here. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for, for being a part of this and people that had to leave, they have to go perform and, and I appreciate that. And thanks for taking your time out of the day to um to come here and hang out and, and listen. And I hope you got something from it. Um, the, the topic of being afraid of improvisation is, I hope you didn't come in thinking it was going to be like a therapy session because I'm not good at that. But what I can do is help you be more prepared and think about music in a different way so it's not like you're thinking about taking a math test. I don't want you to go into music thinking you're taking a test. The idea is 
what can I play to fit musically? Now, if you still say, I have no idea, I don't know what to do, then it's going to be happy. You know, if you have a teacher, have a friend, someone say, well, what, what works? What melody am I playing? If I'm playing CJM blues, and you get up to solo and you go, uh, see, you got to leave room for the uh, you know what I'm saying? So, I didn't do, all I did there was take the melody, or the rhythm of the melody. You don't have to think you have to create everything on the spot. Everything's already been played. You're not going to play anything new. Sorry to tell you that. Everything's been played. There's only 12 notes. Mozart, Justin Bieber, Ella Fitzgerald. They, they all play the same 12 notes. It's about what you do in the moment to fit what's happening here. And there's no shame in saying, you know what? I've heard this rhythm. And I'm going to use that now because it fits in the moment. Now, obviously, you can practice improvisation. A lot of people think you can't practice it. It has to be something that's super on the spot. Um, if I want a bluesy sound, if I want to sound like Ella Fitzgerald, if I want to phrase something like John Coltrane, if I'm looking for that sound in my head, or I want something to be have tension, or I want something to be very constant, or I want something to resolve, I need to have some type of knowledge of what, what key we're playing in, or what, no, not even a key, all right, key doesn't matter. What, what, you know, where beat one is. If we're at the top of the form, and this is something that Gabe always gets mad at with young drummers, know the form of the tune. Don't do a big fill into the, the last A section and then you just kind of ride through the first A. You thought it was the top or something, you know, whatever. Don't do that, or, or even worse, if it's, a, if it's an A, B, an eight bar tune, you resolve to like bar five, because you do like a four bar phrase. And so, it might sound hip, like you're playing over the bar line, yet, well, that's, I'm, I'm not talking about it. <laughs> So, but the, the fear, and last thing, the fear of improvisation is one of, you don't know what to do and how to sound good, but there are specific things you can do to sound good. Fit the rhythms, fit the phrasing, fit the style, create melody, all those things will go a long way. Obviously there's technique on the instrument, learning things in 12 keys, you know, practicing intervals, practicing scales, and training your ear, your sound, which I think is the most important part of playing a wind instrument, or any instrument really is your actual sound, but that's, not, uh, that's for another day. So, uh, any other questions? Any other questions before we get going? We're going to play a tune uh, to end here, and then you guys can go. Yes, Mr. Di Donato. Uh, who are your favorite alto saxophone players, David? Oh, that's a great question. So, obviously, uh, like Charlie Parker is just like the, the original jazz saxophones as we play today. Charlie Parker, Cannonball Adderley, that was said. Some newer people, Kenny Garrett. You guys, let's go listen to Kenny Garrett. Great player. Dick Oates is probably what I model my playing off of. Hey, there you go. Model my playing off of the most. I love, like all these musical elements is what I get from him more than any actual notes. It's all the um, the phrasing, the rhythms, the sound. Um, honestly, a little bit of Paul Desmond, who played in Dave Brubeck's uh, quartet for years and years, just for his sensitivity way he plays. There's actually there's a kid playing now. I say kid. I don't I don't know how old he is. He looks like he's you know in his twenties. Baptiste Herbin. Go check out Baptiste. I think he lives in France. Yes. Baptiste is, is, is one of the, the young monsters. Monsters out there. He's, he's absolutely incredible. Um, but those are some of my favorite players for alto. And I'd like, you know, I used to play with Richie Cole way back in the day, um, who was, you know, friends with Phil Woods. And so Phil Woods is another one of my favorite players. Um, but yeah, those are, those are some that have shaped me. But, but I, I urge you guys, now, if you're a saxophone player, don't just listen to saxophone players. Go listen to trumpet players, listen to trombone players, listen to vocalists. Listen to Ella, start there, start there. Um, you know, listen to piano players. I, I, I get, I steal a lot of lines from Oscar, not lines, but musical things from Oscar Peterson, right? It's, you have to slow it down sometimes, or, or just listen to it a trillion times in a row. Well, I don't actually slow it down, but I just, the, too fast, I just let that go. But Oscar Peterson's great stuff. I listen to Ray Brown playing. Listen to the way Ed Thigpen plays fills. Just, you know, I just named Oscar Peterson's trio, but, you know, but that's a great thing. And, one of my favorite musicians of all time, and someone I got to actually hang out with a lot when I was in college, is Clark Terry, the great trumpet player. Clark Terry is probably one of the most underrated trumpet players of all time, um, just for his ability on the instrument. You want to talk about swing and rhythms, he does some great stuff. Any trumpet players in here? Oh, jeez. <laughs> it was a joke. It's okay. So, Clark Terry, check him out. Uh, flugelhorn and trumpet and all that stuff. And he, uh, he does this thing in this one, this, and Scott's singing here, and he does, you know, um, mumbles. We have to do it with him, awesome. He does this thing with Oscar Pearson's trio, where he goes back and forth, he trades fours with himself on flugelhorn and trumpet. One in the left hand, one in the right hand. And it literally sounds like two completely different players. He's just, it's, it's so crazy. So, um, if you guys want to ask me anything after specifically, uh, please do that. I also, I do have some reads to give away, so if any of you guys raise your hand, 
There's a couple people up here who already left. I meant to do that. So if you're one of my current students, no, you can't, you can't win them. <laughs> Sorry. But if you guys want to come up and talk to me afterwards, I can, I can give out some reads here. I have um, some sample packs from the Dario Woodwinds. I want to thank them for supplying them for alto tenor and battery. So no uh, soprano, those of you out there who like to play Kenny G. <laughs> like me. All right, so if you have no other questions, we're just going to play a tune. Um, everybody always asks for Johnny Steps. Yes. So see, so we're just gonna play. Give the people what they want. Yeah. And and just as a just as a last thing, guys, if you're afraid of improvising, that's totally normal. Every I don't know anybody who just said, yeah, I started soloing, whether it's middle school, high school, and they're like, yeah, I was never nervous at all. Nerves are good. You should really use the nerves to um, to to make you focused, and that means you care. If you didn't care at all, if you're like, yeah, I'm not nervous at all, I don't care. That's worse than being super nervous to me. How you get through the nerves is like the things we talked about, prepare, build melodies, build the stuff. Do it more, just just jam. All of you today did that call and response thing earlier that we're here, and just do stuff like that. And you can do group improvisation if you're too nervous about doing it as, as a thing. It sounds like a pet shop that's burning down, but it's pretty interesting. Here we go, so we're gonna, we're gonna play a little giant steps uh, on the way out, and uh, thank you all so much, really. I wanna thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You know, it was funny, we were talking, we said, uh, we said, if nobody shows up, can we just like jam for an hour? And I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, you guys showed up, so you made the clinic. So without a clinic, it's just us, us talking to a room. Um, what did I say? If, no, if nobody shows up to a gig, it's called rehearsal. <laughs> or a jazz gig. All right, here we go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, one. Let's do a little fast. One, two, one, one, one. Thank you. 
Carl Cohen on the drum set, Mr. Graham Kozak on the bass. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming out. Enjoy the festival, guys. Break a leg up there. Play some great jazz.